All right, howdy folks. Um, I'm here with April 2023's Roundup. So if you're not familiar, I write a Substack newsletter at readpolymathematics.substack.com. And once a month on that newsletter, I send out a Roundup post, which is essentially the best podcast episodes and reading I did that month, as well as cool people and projects I came across. And then I usually tack on some personal updates as well. So uh, I, January, I started making video equivalents to them. So I'm going to go through April's. Um, all of these links will be in the bottom description if you're interested. So I'm going to start with the podcast Rex from April. I listened to two great episodes of The Tim Ferriss Show. Obviously, Tim Ferriss is one of the most popular podcasters out there, so it's likely that you've heard of his podcast, but if you haven't seen or listened to these specific episodes, uh, I highly recommend them. The first one is his conversation with Derek Sivers. Derek's been on the podcast before. Uh, he is a entrepreneur. He started companies, uh, tinkerer and website builder, musician. Uh, he's bit, had given a bunch of popular TED Talks, so that's kind of the mode he's in. Uh, but he lives in New Zealand, I think, right now, and it seems like Tim and he have uh, been good friends, and Tim was visiting him, and they had an in-person conversation that was really beautiful. It kind of reminded me of why I fell in love with podcasts to begin with. Um, it seems like there's kind of a formula right now, even good podcasts tend to have. But Tim's really done a good job of balancing that conversational aspect about audio and podcast formats that make it so special and feel so intimate, but also not just meandering and um, unimportant topics. So they actually cover things that have substance. So that's a good balance that Tim's able to consistently um, deliver on. So this conversation with Derek Sivers is really fascinating, particularly the front half is about Derek's recent explorations um, to become sort of technologically or digitally independent. So not relying on the cloud services like AWS or Azure, um, having your own server, building your own website rather than using something like WordPress or Squarespace, um, security um, and all of that kind of stuff, hosting your own email service. A lot of cool topics and Derek's rationale for that, it's not so much of like a prepper or even like a security paranoia about like data lakes and things, although that's part of it. It also has to do with knowing your way around these tools and the creative expression that comes from uh, building them yourselves. I'm particularly interested in that right now because I've been rebuilding my website um, right now. I kind of have my work in a few places, so I have like a portfolio website that you know goes with my res resume or CV or just like to showcase the types of projects I've built. So that's that was built on Notion and just published to the web through Notion's um, uh, website feature basically. Um, I also have like my newsletters uh, through Substack and so like all my writing and the writing I'm most proud of is up there. But then I have um, a WordPress site that I've been running since 2017, which is polymathematics.blog. And I put all my newsletter blog post writing on the blog, um, but I also have other tabs like sort of my year uh, goals. Uh, so every year since I started this last year and um, have carried it into this year, I do these, uh, they're not New Year's resolutions. I call them like rough drafts for the year. So. I kind of sketch out what I want my year to look like and have very measurable um, uh, items within like a table of what I want my year to look like. So I have that up there um, and just some other stuff. Like I usually track everything I've been reading on my blog. So I'm kind of scattered on the internet and I've been um, feeling a growing need to consolidate everything. Um, and I've been you know, really loving programming lately. So I decided to kind of rebuild my site from scratch, not only to simplify, but also to save money so I don't have to host on like WordPress or Squarespace or any of that. Um, and to develop my programming skills and continue learning, but also just to have more like customizations and creative uh, control over my website. So I've been having a lot of fun with that. But um, so that's why that resonated with me. The next episode of Tim Ferriss I'd recommend is his conversation with Kevin Kelly. If you don't know, um, Kevin started 
uh, Wired Mag, and he's just kind of a polymath in his own right. Um, he's lived many lives, and uh, I guess a lot of people refer to him as a futurist. He's an author, and he just thinks about technology and social media and AI and the world um, in really interesting, unique ways. And it's always refreshing to hear Kevin Kelly's um, opinion on things because he's a first principles uh, thinker and creative thinker, but also just lighthearted and wise. Um, and I think he and Tim have become um, friends over the years. And Kevin's been making the rounds because he has this awesome new book out, which is basically just a compilation of short advice sort of snippets. Um, and so he's been on a bunch of podcasts, but this one just is special. I think him and Tim have a good relationship where Kevin can kind of open up and be natural. Um, and Tim's not trying to sort of get anything out of it other than providing value. Um, they talk a lot about uh, like family and starting traditions. And I found that fascinating. Um, how do you build out like a culture for your family and have things to look forward to and rites of passage? I find that fascinating. Um, how do you let your kids be themselves and um, creating, he talks about like having his kids create their own like MFA programs if they didn't want to go to college and creating like legitimate containers for your explorations I find interesting. Um, and then one of the cool topics and riffs they get on is instead of aiming to be the best at the thing you're interested in doing, aim to be the only. So how can you create a career and a life that allows you to be yourself in the most sort of radical way. And by being yourself, you're not able to be copied by other human competitors, you know, businesses, creators, whatever, or even AI now that that's entered the uh, arena. So I found that super fascinating. I would check that out. The next podcast, um, I've been listening off and on to Founders Podcast. Um, and so it's uh, hosted by this guy called David. Um, and basically what he does is he just reads biographies and autobiographies uh, from like inventors, entrepreneurs, business people. Um, and he just kind of goes through his notes and like riffs on the lessons he learned from reading them and uh, really gives you a good sense of what the biography or autobiography is about and some of like the biggest kernels from within those. But David, he gets so pumped up about it. Like you can tell it's not just like uh, a way for him to create a podcast that has a big audience. Like he really loves distilling lessons and reading biographies and autobiographies from some of the most successful creative inventor or generative people. And he has this amazing episode about James Dyson from the autobiography Against the Odds by James Dyson. And it just got me so pumped up to keep creating things and pulling ideas into reality. And I didn't realize how rough James Dyson's trajectory was to getting Dyson to be the successful company it is today. And the nugget of wisdom I really loved and I've kind of internalized since listening to that podcast is like by being different, so like just difference alone can be the thing that makes you successful in business or as a person or in your career. Um, and the idea of looking what other people are doing in a given space and by simply doing something differently, and ideally that difference is informed by your opinion of what ought to be done. It's not just a randomized difference, but even that is fun to play with. But basically that idea of difference being a crucial differentiator for success. And James Dyson talks about how he applied that to his high school track career as a runner and then also business. So I, that, that podcast pumped me up. And if you like that, check out James Dyson on How I Built This, which is the Guy Raz uh, NPR podcast, because that's a great uh, uh, podcast about James Dyson. And he's actually interviewed by Guy, so you get to hear from him yourself in that one. Uh, and that one pumped me up from a year or two ago, too. The other podcast Rex is Stephen Wolfram was on two uh, podcasts that I listen to regularly. And Stephen Wolfram's just another of these sort of polymath types who is just such an idea person and such a deep thinker that kind of wherever they are interested and curious uh, in applying that thinking to, they're going to have interesting and different powerful results. And so like Stephen Wolfram's done that with um, 
you know, like Wolfram Alpha, his company and the, the language, um, sort of mathematical notation, computer language, um, but also with his thinking on AI and cellular automa uh, autonoma, or uh, I forget how you say it, but basically this idea of um, starting with the simplest set of instructions uh, from that simplicity emerges complexity and these sort of greater complex interactions even from a extremely simple algorithm. Um, so he was on two podcasts I listen to a lot, This Week in Startups, which is Jason Calacanis' podcast. And that one's really awesome because they kind of focus more on the AI side of things and you get to hear Steven's take on where we're at today with large language models and tools like ChatGPT and OpenAI's GPT large language model. Um, but also, he kind of recounts from his perspective the history of artificial intelligence research. So I found it very valuable in that respect. And he's such a clear thinker that he does it very well. Um, so you really get a sense of where we're at in historical context. Um, he was also on RT and Sriram's podcast, which uh, I've been loving lately. And I actually got to ask him a question vicariously through RT and Sriram because they had tweeted uh, asking, you know, what would you ask Stephen Wolfram? We're having him on the podcast. And I had heard that he, I think he was on Tim Ferriss or maybe it was from that This Week in Startups episode, but I had heard that he keeps extremely detailed records about his life. So like typical notes and journaling and sort of creating a database, searchable database of all his notes and what he did on any given day. But also like down to the keystrokes on his computer are all recorded and saved. And so I had asked, you know, what's the most interesting pattern or observation that that sort of rigorous record keeping has yielded for him? Um, and so they, that was the first question they asked him. So the first like four minutes of the podcast are spent on that, which was amazing. It was super awesome to get that question in there. Um, but yeah, he's just such a fascinating person. And RT and Sriram are clearly huge fans of his. So it's a fun conversation because they're genuinely interested in sort of getting these answers out of them um, and having that uh, conversation. Okay, so then next are the reading recs. Um, both of these are focused on like these reading recs are focused on reading, uh, which I just thought was interesting um, that those are the two I picked out. The first one uh, is called Libraries Need More Freedom to Distribute Digital Books. Uh, it was written in the Atlantic by Dan Cohen. And essentially it's, a, it's an overview of ongoing litigation in the most recent court case um, between sort of the big publishers the big book publishers, and the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive is a project I've featured on my blog before because it's really awesome and aligns with sort of the stuff I'm interested in about archiving all of this valuable information on the Internet. But apparently, so during COVID, all the public libraries were shut down for lockdown restrictions. And um, one of the things the Internet Archive did was start uh, distributing ebook copies of the books and content that they had archived. And th this goes back, uh, there's this sort of framework that allowed um, public libraries and libraries to lend out uh, ebook copies of the books they had already had sort of licenses and contracts with publishers to uh, distribute. And apparently there's like some key ratios that are typically stuck to so that you don't lend out like a hundred ebook copies. Um, and so they'll only be allowed to lend out like four at a time of a given copy or something. And I guess the Internet Archive kind of lifted that restriction during COVID and ended up getting sued. And it's this big sort of uh, debate over access to information and what uh, these smaller libraries or public libraries, which are public goods, um, are allowed to share because they have all these readers who uh, basically libraries and public libraries are competing with against like Amazon and stuff. Um, but you can go get these things for free from your public library, but the problem, and I run into this all the time with the Austin public library system, 
there's just huge wait lists for ebooks um, and physical books. So they're really limited on how they can support their readers and the content that the readers want to read most. So it's a really uh, fascinating sort of philosophical debate, and you can read that for a snippet of it. The next one uh, is from Ian Bogost, uh, also for The Atlantic. It's called Why Are Ebooks So Terrible? And this is an awesome sort of more design and history of design article about the invention of codex, right? Like the way we read today. Instead of scrolls, we read in these bound pages that flip um, right to left, left to right, depending on uh, your language system. And kind of the way books are designed to package informational content and how ebooks have had to make uh, different des design decisions to package that same info and content because they don't use the codex system, at least. They don't have the physical representation of what uh, physical books have. And so this article goes through all the different design decisions and trade-offs that ebooks had to make, and also the advantages of ebooks, you know, like you can carry infinite books with you at once, or near infinite, uh, instead of a giant heavy stack of books. Uh, highlighting is a lot easier. Um, you can, you know, adaptive display, but then there's all these downsides too. You know, you can't just randomly physically open up to a book page that you know you've tabbed and has an interesting uh, passage or bit of information that you want to retrieve. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting things like that that this article covers. So if you're interested in design and like the history of big technological inventions like our reading system, the Gutenberg Press, printing press, all of that, check that out. Okay, um, finally, I'll just cover some cool projects. The first is a self-plug that you might be interested in for a project I built in April. It's called Mot Mot, M-O-T, M-O-T, Mot Mot. And basically, it's named after this um, South American bird, this blue and green bird that I found. Um, but basically, what it is, is it's a Chrome extension. Um, and when you install the Chrome extension, you can highlight text anywhere on the web and then right click it to tweet that bit of highlighted text. So basically it takes two clicks to tweet out any uh, highlighted text that you highlight while you're reading articles or blogs or whatever online. So um, if you want to use MotMot or try it out, it's completely free. Uh, leave a comment or uh, shoot me an email at hi uh, at polymathematics dot com I believe let me double check that um, do, do. did I get that right yeah hi at polymathematics dot net I'm sorry shoot me an email um, and uh, I'll give you access to MotMot it's not in the Chrome store yet I'll probably get it out there um, but I have to like optimize images and things like that for it. So I can get it to you sooner by just giving you the actual uh, zipped folder to install into your Chrome browser. And then, yeah, that way whenever you're reading something and you find something interesting, you can just highlight it with your mouse, right click and hit tweet this and it'll tweet it out for you. So that's been fun to build and super useful for me. I've just, I've been building projects recently. Um, I'm newer to programming, I'm self-taught. Um, the first line of code I wrote was probably 2018 when I took um, a required MATLAB course for my chemical engineering degree. Um, and I really fell in love with programming, or at least got a taste of the excitement and really loved that class, even MATLAB, which is notoriously a bad programming language. Um, and then uh, at the first company I worked for, which was a desalination startup, uh, I got involved with Arduino and C++ programming, and again, really just got sort of enamored with what you can do with programming and I've been tinkering with programming ever since and in the last year or so have kind of gotten more deliberate about launching program uh, you know software projects and yeah just anytime I have a personal need for something something that'll help my workflow um, or you know habits like I read a lot and I want to tweet stuff from articles and instead of having to open Twitter and a separate tab and highlight it copy pasting it now I just have this tool so I've just been building personal projects that really help me, and then if other people like them, it's awesome. So I've been enjoying that process. All right, two more projects to highlight. One um, 
I subscribe to actually Kevin Kelly as a co-founder of this newsletter called Recommendo, and they'll just send once a week um, like three to five recommendations of cool stuff they find online. Um, and they gave a shout out to this project called Space Elevator in their most recent Recommendo newsletter. And it's coded by this guy called Neil Argawal. And basically what it is, is it's a website and you start on Earth and you get in this little space elevator and then you just scroll your way up the page and the space elevator is heading through the different atmosphere levels um, on Earth. And you kind of get to see, you know, here's where the bald eagle flies. Here's where um, a party balloon would pop. Here's where this uh, airplane typically flies. Here's the altitude the highest uh, manned aircraft has ever reached. Here's where Felix Baumgartner, you know, dropped from for his uh, record free fall, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up. And there's tons of cool stuff, like you get to pick your little astronaut suit when you get too high, you get to put a scarf on. Um, there's elevator music and you can change the tunes. So it's just a really fun project. And I've been really interested, like I said, I've been programming more and I'm looking for like more creative coding, like just fun, silly projects or very unique, um, artful projects rather than just clean SaaS software and like neatly packaged apps. So this is definitely in that realm. And all, I went digging and found the rest of Neil's work and all his projects are fun like that. There's another one called Absurd Trolley Problems, which is a riff on the classic trolley problem uh, philosophical thought experiment uh, where there's all these varying absurd versions of it. So just tons of cool fun projects like that. Check out Neil's work, it's awesome. The next project to highlight is um, from CW&T, which is a husband and wife design duo that I've been following for a while. Uh, my friend Camilo showed me them like in 2016 or something. Um, they do tons of cool projects. They're, they've launched like 13 Kickstarters and they're launching their latest Kickstarter uh, tomorrow actually. And I kind of ordered V1 of the uh, product that they're launching. So my version is 3D printed plastic. Here it is, um, I'll explain it in a second. But now they're making like extruded aluminum versions for their Kickstarter tomorrow. So definitely check that out. Um, I'll link to it below. But essentially what this is, it's called 556688. And it's uh, for your phone and it has these three varying angles you can prop your phone up. So one was for them for like group FaceTimes, one's for like solo video calls, uh, one's for like recipes. Obviously everyone finds their own needs. But um, yeah, I got this because I had a similar one, but it was much uglier and only one angle and I couldn't use it for filming. So it was just kind of a prop to hold my phone instead of putting it on the desk. So it didn't really do much. But now uh, I can use this for filming, like when I film uh, TikToks or you know FaceTime, whatever and also for cooking, for recipes. Uh, so it's a cool project, check it out. It doesn't charge your phone or anything like that. It's just uh, a beautiful object. And the extruded aluminum one is gonna have like good weight to it. I mean, it's aluminum, but it'll be weightier than this plastic. Uh, so I'm planning on backing that project and getting one of those as well. But yeah, it's cool to try out like the V1 uh, plastic version and uh, recommend checking out all CWNT's work. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, thanks for checking out the roundup. I'll be back with May's roundup and hopefully have some other videos uh, coming out soon. My, my fiance Tess and I are getting married uh, in the beginning of June, so I'll be kind of busy um, in May. So maybe not, maybe won't have time to get videos up, but uh, should be back around June, uh, middle of June. So yeah, thanks for watching. See ya.